Oh, such good stuff so far, yes? Uh, We're going to start our sermon time, and I'm going to do some of the sermon, like right here, right now, live. (laughs) I know, right? Uh, So for those who may be new, I'm Pastor Sarah, and I've been in recovery from post-concussion syndrome, which has meant this last year I've been preaching via video, so I make the video ahead of time, and... Uh, I do, I've been doing that because it's a lot for my brain to take in like all the things of the adrenaline and my body hasn't known how to process the adrenaline very well yet. So it's still, I've been regulating all that and getting back to normal. Uh, and so I've been filming ahead of time. Uh, but I want to take a few minutes just to start the sermon time live as my part of like baby stepping back into the process. So we'll do a few minutes now and then we'll see how it goes. And as I just relearn how to do this whole sermon preaching thing again, right? And I do want to say a few things about that. I want to name that this process of getting back into preaching, I think it'll take me some time to kind of figure it out because I have some nerves and like this whole new brain I'm working with now, right? So I also feel pretty vulnerable about it because it's just, it's been a long time, right? So yes, so I think I just want to name, I think it'll be awkward sometimes and maybe not awesome. Um, I just want to name that up front and like own that. (laughs) Oh, um, and I just want to say that because here at Saw House, you know, we say that the invitation is to come and be who you are, right? Fully as you are to be in process, be growing and changing and not have it all together. And that has to be true for me too, right? Right. So I want to say all this so that you can be in on my process and so I don't have to pretend like I'm some superhuman that just gets back up and I can do this, right? Right? Like it takes time. And so... Yes, so that's, that's what we're doing. So instead, I want to be true to what we know about the Jesus story, right? This is a story that we live through deaths and resurrections again and again, and you all know I've been living through a lot of death in this last year, but I'm coming up into, resurre- into resurrection, which is so good, and new life takes time. So thank you in advance for just joining me in this process of experimenting and becoming So thank you for just being gracious and patient as I find my voice again here live in this space. So I do want to ask, though, are you game for that? Will you be in process with me as I begin this work of finding my way into new life and preaching with you all? You game? Woo! Thank you. You guys have been so gracious in this past year, and I'm so grateful for how all of that continues. All right. So here we go. You ready? Ready? So just to orient us as we begin today, next Sunday will be our final Sunday in our Love is a Verb fall sermon series where we have been exploring the seven core practices, the core things that we actually do here together here at Salt House so that we can then, we do them here so we can practice them everywhere too. They are practices that help shape us into this life of Jesus. Love is a verb, love that is lived. And so I want, you know, maybe you've noticed every week we've watched that sermon series trailer, right? You've seen that. It sets us up each week, which names all seven of our core practices. Have you noticed how every week we intentionally list them out, like the words of what our seven core practices are so we can see them every week? Which means I would think by now that y'all probably have a pretty good handle on what those seven core practices are. Like hypothetically, if I were to call on you right now, you'd be able to stand up and recite the seven core practices for the rest of the room, right? 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 Okay, I'm not going to do that. But I do, um, I do think it'd be good for us, fun for us. Okay, maybe fun for me. Uh, if we could do a little like group pop quiz where together we kind of shout out those seven core practices that we have. Do you think it's possible? Collaborate together? Okay, great. I'm going to check them off. Class? Okay, so what are our seven core practices here at Salt House? Sermon trailers. <laughs> we do have sermon trailers all the time, yes. Radical welcome. Radical welcome. Eating together. Eating together. Engaging homelessness. Stories Stories matter. Hearing God. God. We have two more. Living generously. generously. Yep, I heard it. Being changed. That's all seven. Woo, nice job. I'll be honest, this morning when I was running my little list, I got to six, and I was like, oh, what's the last one? And then I had to look it up. Okay, so um, class, great work. Thank you. Uh, Man, so if you were here last week or if you tuned in later, what was the core practice that we, be, we began talking about last Sunday? Living generously. Living generously, that's right. And just like Lucy and Ethan a moment ago, what did we talk about 
as our posture for living generously. What did we talk about last year, last week? Re- receiving, yep. And we talked about these open hands that we have. Yes. So receiving these open hands. And this is what we do in Holy Communion, right? We, we expose our need. We practice receiving. We open up. As we come up to the table, we practice that vulnerability. Man, practicing this posture every time so that we can be people who practice receiving and being vulnerable everywhere, right? And in our practice of Holy Communion, we do receive, right? We get to see and watch as this grace, this bread, this mystery meets us every time. So today we're going to come back to this posture again. So will you do this with me? Will you just lay your hands on your lap, open, comfortably, open hands. We named last week again how receiving is so hard, right? So hard. No one loves being vulnerable, right? And today we get to continue this conversation naming that open hands. It's not only about how we receive, right? It's also a posture for how we give. It's an invitation into the Jesus story as this posture of open hands of generosity, which means holding loosely that which is placed into our hands so that we can give it away. We can, we can be active with it, receiving and giving. So I invite you just to keep your hands open as that's comfortable for you as we dive into this conversation. So to get us into this conversation, we're going to turn to our reading. It is from the book of Matthew. It's uh, Matthew's one of the four biographies of Jesus there in the New Testament. And we're going to read one of the parables that's there. So parables are stories that Jesus told that hold layer upon layer of meaning. They are filled with winks and nudges and like inside jokes. And so we get to keep coming back to them over the course of our lives to see what new layers we can excavate together. And I'm really excited about our excavation work for today. So this particular parable, it's the one where a man leaves on a journey, but before leaving, he gives money to three of his servants. Sometimes when you read this text, the money is referred to as coins, sometimes talents. So the parable of the talents might be a familiar uh, phrase for you. But this version we'll read is bags of gold, because why wouldn't you choose the version with bags of gold, right? Right? Yeah. So it's important to know that each of the three servants, they get different sums of money, but for all of them, it's just a massive sum of money. Bible interpreters have tried to figure out what that would be in our dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe a couple million Uh, It's just a bonkers amount of money, which is important for us in understanding the story. So, just there's this boss man, right? He has servants, so before going on his trip, he entrusts his wealth to his servants, and it's a ridiculous amount of money, all right? So, wake up your brain, engage your imagination. Uh, Please picture this parable that Jesus shares and see what details grab you, what what interests you. Um, Yeah, thank you again just for this chance to take a moment to preach live. We're going to hear our reading, and then the video will pick up where we, and take us to to the rest of it, okay? Okay. Hi. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid 
and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bags of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Dun, dun, dun. Right? So this is probably a familiar parable to many of us. And we have likely heard a message about it that is really easy to see at first read. It's there on the surface, right? That Jesus is sharing this story as a rousing pep talk about how whatever you, whatever you have, you should do something with it or you'll get judged for not doing anything and end up being cast into a place with weeping and gnashing of teeth, often equated with kind of a hell scenario, right? So the moral becomes try harder, do more, to which we have to ask, is that the best Jesus can do? You better do something or you're gonna get judged, really? We have to believe that Jesus has more going on here than like sanctified motivational speaking, right? And he does. So our first clue that there's something at a deeper level is just the outrageousness and ridiculousness of this story. This man, this boss man, right? Uh, He's an owner, he's a master, and he goes on a journey, gives his servants ridiculously massive sums of gold. Who does that, right? That is unheard of. So we don't see how ludicrous it is at first because this parable has become really familiar for many of us, but this is just nuts. This never happens, which tells us, hmm, something is going on here, right? And we need to look a little deeper beneath the surface, yes? So let's dig into, excavate, right, some of the details of the story and see where we get, okay? So the first thing is what really what we've just named, that this boss man, he entrusts his servants, the lowest of the low, with his fortune. Here, have all my wealth. Notice, the story begins with lavish, unmerited favor and abundance. The instigating incident of the story is grace, gift, abundance, then everything is set in motion. He doesn't ask them to be productive. He doesn't offer quotas or rules or boundaries about it. The only guideline is do something with it. So the owner has this massive abundance and, he, and what he does without abundance is that he passes it on to the lowest and the least among them. Yeah, you starting to feel this? So for the boss man, this is risky, yes? The story also begins with massive risk. One of the many reasons we know this is because he even says to the one bag of gold guy, right? At the end, he says, you could have just given it to a banker and at least then you would have gotten a little interest. So the boss man knows even he himself could have invested in some banking system and had a safe place to increase his, his money if he wanted to do that. But he doesn't want to do that. He rolls the dice on his servants. He risks, and here's the thing, He rolls the dice on their participation, participation in the grace, the blessing, the favor, the gift of that money. And the owner, you know, is not only fine with that risk, but the owner embraces it and he celebrates it. It's as if the risk is worth it if it means that the servants get to participate too. The owner doesn't want to play it safe because he wants participation. Participation in the abundance. Servants choosing to participate with what the boss man has given them makes the risk worth it. Here's my wealth. Do something with it. It's worth it. And then for the two servants who choose to participate in the owner's abundance, when the boss man comes home, what does he say to them? He says, come share in my happiness. Oh, and here's some more abundance. Let's have another round of participation. Did you notice that? Sharing in the boss man's happiness is what happens when they participate with more of that abundance and happiness to come as a result of that participation. Yeah, you with me? 
But the owner is furious at the end of the parable. The problem, uh, when we read the parable of the talents, which we often have heard, you know, where that interpretation where you better do something with what you've been given or else God will be angry. The problem is that in that version, God is just one more demanding, easily angered taskmaster. So how this ends, you know, where the taskmaster just kind of goes off can read into that kind of interpretation. But I would argue that that is a misreading of the story. Instead, he's righteously pissed at the one bad guy, or another word that might get kind of closer to it, the boss man is deeply offended. But listen to why. So one bag guy's explanation to why he buried his bag is, I knew you were a hard man. Some translations say, I thought you were cruel. Really? You did? Where does he get this idea? Because nowhere in the story do we get the image of a hard man who is ruthless, right? The image in the story is the opposite of that. The owner is the kind of owner that gives his servants massive sums of money with apparently very few rules about what to do with it. He wants his servants to participate, and when he comes home, he just wants them to share in his happiness. One bad guy fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the owner. Or to be more particular, he refuses to believe that the owner is really like that. And what seems to crank up the boss man, the owner, is not just that the one bag guy buries his money, he still has that one bag of gold, so it's not a loss, but what cranks up the owner is how one bag guy sees the owner. That's not who the owner is, how he is. He's not cruel. So the point of the story is that this is not one more demanding, easily angered taskmaster. This is someone saying, look at what I've given you. All that's left for you to do is to trust that I'm really that good. Trust that the gift is really a gift. And the only thing that's expected as you trust is that you'll then participate in some way. As with all the parables, of course, Jesus is revealing the nature of God and the invitation extended to us into a life of with God, lived with God. And in this particular parable, this is the picture we have of our God, right? Who entrusts God's ridiculous abundance with us and just wants us to play with it, right? To participate. And when we do, to see how it's such an experience of God's goodness and joy and happiness. And this isn't just commentary about money, right? It is all that we have been given. It's who we are, it's ourselves, it's our gifts and passions, our time, the energy that we have. It's the presence of God, the spirit that is within us. So my friends, are your hands still open? The invitation is for us to see what has been placed in our hands and say, look at this gift. All that you have, all that you are. It's hard to open our hands to expose our need and to receive, right? It is also hard to say yes to the risk of keeping our hands open in the posture of generosity, yes? For so many reasons. I mean, we are bombarded by a scarcity culture. We're bombarded by the need to have the like the new and best things. I know I was raised in a family that kept things very fair, which isn't a bad thing, but the way it affected me is that it's often a competing message at times with my attempts to hold my hands open, participating with God, instead of like holding tight to what I think I deserve, right? Anyone with me? I totally wanna like bury my bag of gold, right, and keep it. Let me just hang on to that. But one of the best lessons that I have learned in generosity in participating with God, with my hands staying open, not burying the bag, it has come from y'all. Our story, which we began to tell last Sunday here at Salt House, the Salt House story, we really began as a story of generosity, that this building and $100,000 was given away for the sake of something new being born here. That Trinity Lutheran Church that used to be here, they gave this away to be born as something new. Our story, this could be a parable, right? Such over-the-top generosity. Our story begins with lavish, unmerited favor and abundance. A building and $100,000 placed in our hands. 
That instigating incident in our story of such open-handed generosity is what formed us initially to have this core practice of living generously, yes? We have held this building and what we have with that same open-handedness with God. It's been awesome to see. We've held our hands open four years ago in November. It was November 28th, 2015, when our entire community at the time, we gathered to decide whether or not we should let our 3,000 square foot unfinished basement become a day center for for families experiencing homelessness. And we said a unanimous yes. We hold our hands open to all the folks who use our building throughout the week. Did you know that, that uh, we treat the space of ours like it isn't ours? And if you're someone who has helped clean up after worship on any Sunday, which we always need help with, so please stay today if you'd like. But if you've helped do that, putting away of all the things, you know everything gets put away. So that the two other congregations who, have, uh, who we have here in, over the course of the weekend, East Side Seventh-day Adventists are here on Friday night and all day Saturday, and then Ebenezer, a Spanish-speaking congregation, are here. They'll be here in just a few hours. There's an Al-Anon group who's been meeting weekly here for years. There's a Young Life Bible study for girls from Lake Washington High School that meets early in the morning every week. With this building, we hold our hands open. We hold our hands open with our land, too, when we sold a sixth of our property to the city of Kirkland to become a 24-hour shelter for families and for women experiencing homelessness, meeting a critical growing need here on the east side. And is it not just our physical space that we hold our hands open with uh, to engage home- homelessness? Man, our staff daily, we engage in the, in the support of the work of the New Bethlehem Day Center. And then also with the eventual per- permanent shelter too. Uh, it's just in what we do here as a staff. It's the unexpected interruptions that we have with construction happening now. It's helping clients to knock on or our door, find the entrance to the day center. It's managing packages that come to our door that are for the clients there. It's managing the garbage and recycling pickup that we share with the day center. This week, we also began making plans for how to deal with extreme winter weather, right? So we'll help families experiencing homelessness upstairs here in our space if and when we get slammed with snow this year. So we're already getting that in place, so we're ready to make that happen. This is just part of what our staff does every day. Part of what we all support in our ongoing offerings to Salt House is this ongoing, messy, open-headed generosity with who we are and how we engage with the needs of our community. Pretty awesome. We have said these yeses even as we've been a new, small, growing church. And if I am totally honest with you, like, I really struggled with some of these yeses. Like, I didn't want to sell our land at first. What if we needed it, right? We wouldn't get it back. We were still so new, you know, how can we sell it? Or if we do sell it, you know, should we sell it to a developer and get a lot more cash for it? Or I wanted to bury this bag of gold of ours, right? But I did my own work and discernment around what God was saying. I remembered our story of living generously, that we were living here together, and y'all helped me remember that. And I really think we helped each other remember that, that all of this is not ours, it's God's placed in our hands, and we get to remind each other to keep our hands open and participate with God with what we've been given. And with all of these ways, we have kept our hands open. We have absolutely experienced God's happiness that the boss man speaks of in our parable. We know this sense of purpose and joy and sacrifice and mission that we share here in using what we have to engage with homelessness and with the needs of our community. Pretty awesome. So one final word about the final word in our parable, too. The weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? Such good news to end a story on. Mm -hmm. So there's this moment at the end, and it really is a moment of judgment. And for many of us, the associations we have with judgment, talked about in church, is something that happened um, like when you die, like afterlife. And, but that's not what this is here. We can actually read the parable and the judgment that happens here in the parable as something that happens now. Because judgment is, in essence, exposure. It reveals what has been true the whole time. Judgment is consequence. And so the consequence that the parable reveals is if we don't trust the owner, if we don't trust God, if we refuse to participate in the extravagant, over-the-top grace and gift, then we will miss out on the joy and happiness right now. 
It's like an urgent call to live in the abundance and joy now because otherwise we will miss out on it now. So when we live stingy and it comes back on us right now, when we live with our fears ruling our life, when we live in our smallness, our tightness, our rule keeping, we live in our obsession with being right and whatever it is that we are, we will miss out on the joy now. That's what the weeping and gnashing of teeth is about, yeah? Again, my friends, participation has been our story as we try to live generously here at Saw House and the ways in which we hold what we've been given. We've participated in so much goodness and joy and abundance. Yes, now, like, that's absolutely what we're experiencing. We participate with participated with God and said yes to the day center. Then we were given more abundance as we participated in selling our land. And we have this abundant gift of our staff that we keep resourcing them to participate with God in the work and support of the day center and with the permanent shelter. And we will keep telling our story here. I will keep saying this story to you. <laughs> we will keep telling this story to remind ourselves of this core practice of living generously especially because we'll soon have a new opportunity to hold our hands open with how we use our, part of this building, our basement. This summer, when the day center moves into the new building, we'll get to decide what we do with our basement. It'll be available again. What will it become? It's another invitation to hold our hands open in generosity, right? To connect what we have been given with that sense of mission and purpose, to participate with God. I think we can also ask, you know, how the basement can become flexible space. It's shared space so that we can use it too, like we do with the rest of our space up here. But my guess is that it will also be a space serving folks experiencing homeless in some way. And if you feel a nudge to help join in that conversation, that work to make those plans and discern what happens with our basement, we're gonna form a group in January, like our basement team. So we'd love for your open-handed energy to be a part of that, if that's something that you're interested in. So now, as our final, final word on all of this, as always, we hear this not only as an invitation for how we practice love, living generously here as a community at Salt House, right? But we also hear it in our dispersed individual lives, how we practice love living generously everywhere with what we have. You know, some people get hung up on a question uh, in this parable regarding the difference in quantity that's given to each servant. Did that come up for you? You know, but why do servants get different amounts? Like, does that say something about how God gives us different amounts and some people have more and maybe I have less? And do you wonder about this? And I would argue though, that this isn't about quantification, about how much did each receive, but this is making a statement. This is about how each of them uses all that they got. They use all that they have, no matter, no matter the amount, right? That's the point of five, two, and one, because five, two, and one become what is given. So as you hear this parable, my friends, Jesus is inviting us to see these open hands of ours, right? Are they still open? And to become curious about what God is saying to you in this parable. What's well, coming up for you? Man, there is so much that comes up for me in this parable. Man, uh, even just how I know I can be the one bad guy, right? And that there are times when I just don't trust that God is this extravagant giver. And I appreciate this parable because it reminds me that how I see God, who I believe God to be, it shapes everything, right? It shapes what one big guy does, yeah? So what's scratching at you in this? Here's the thing, whatever it is, it should feel risky. It should feel uncomfortable. Parables, if we really peel back the layers, they should get at us in uncomfortable ways. And with this parable, yeah, it's risky to keep our hands open, to participate with the abundance we've been given. And we know this, yes? That is the terrifying thing about love and money and politics and creating things and yes, generosity. Anytime we act, anytime we move, anytime we step toward another in love, anytime we elect someone to office, there's a chance the whole thing will go belly up. The invitation is to risk. So it's uncomfortable. 
Jesus lays out this truly bizarre story about over-the-top, abundant, absurd grace handed out to the least of these, to servants. And the invitation is to risk because participation is the thing. And in the story, the boss man wants everyone to participate with all that they have. And when they apparently do something with it, he's like, come on now and share my happiness. And how's, how about having a little bit more too? Isn't that something? How's that for an image for how it all works, yeah? This changes everything when we let it. So friends, how is God inviting you to come and join in what already is happening? All we do is trust that God is our abundant giver. We receive it and we participate as we keep these hands open, living generously. Let's pray. God, I pray now that you would meet each of us right where we are in this and help us just to be open and honest about where we find ourselves in this parable. To own that we often feel like one bad guy where we don't know you as our generous God. To own the ways we feel spread thin. To own how things feel scarce for us or even hopeless. So God, help us to own wherever we are, to own to own that without shame or excuse. And also to let you meet us there in that place, here, now. To meet us in our open hands and to help us know that you hold us with these hands. You hold all of who we are as beloved. And for whatever way you are inviting us to keep our hands open, to risk and participate with you, help us to see that and to move forward, participating with you. So in all of this, we simply breathe and listen now as we sing with our hands and our hearts open, inviting you, God, to take us and to take our lives into your joy and your abundance. Amen.